Gone with the Wind, novel. Gone with the Wind is a novel by American writer Margaret Mitchell, first published in 1936. The story is set in Clayton County in Atlanta, both in Georgia, during the American Civil War and Reconstruction era. It depicts the struggles of young Scarlett O'Hara, the spoiled daughter of the well-to-do plantation owner, who must use every means at her disposal to claw her way out of poverty following Sherman's destructive march to the sea. This historical novel features a Bildungsroman or coming-of-age story, with the title taken from a poem written by Ernest Dowson. Gone with the Wind was popular with American readers from the outset and was the top American fiction bestseller in 1936 and 1937.As of 2014, a Harris poll found it to be the second favorite book of American readers, just behind the Bible. More than 30 million copies have been printed worldwide. Written from the perspective of the slaveholder, Gone with the Wind is Southern plantation fiction. Its portrayal of slavery in African Americans has been considered controversial, especially by succeeding generations, as well as its use of a racial epithet and ethnic slurs common to the period. However, the novel has become a reference point for subsequent writers of the South, both black and white. Scholars at American universities refer to, interpret, and study it in their writings. The novel has been absorbed into American popular culture. Mitchell received the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for the book in 1937. It was adapted into a 1939 American film. Gone with the Wind is the only novel by Mitchell published during her lifetime. Mitchell used color symbolism, especially the colors red and green, which frequently are associated with Scarlet O. Apostrophe Mitchell identified the primary theme as survival. She left the ending speculative for the reader. She was often asked what became of her lovers, Red and Scarlet. She replied, For all I know, Rhett may have found someone else who was less difficult. Two sequels authorized by Mitchell's estate where he published more than a half century later. A parody was also produced. Born in 1900 in Atlanta, Georgia, Margaret Mitchell was a Southerner and writer throughout her life. She grew up hearing stories about the American Civil War and the Reconstruction from her tyrannical Irish-American grandmother, who had endured its suffering. Her forceful and intellectual mother was a suffragist who fought for the rights of women to vote. As a young woman, Mitchell found love with an army lieutenant. He was killed in World War I, and she would carry his memory for the remainder of her life. After studying at Smith College for a year, during which time her mother died from the Spanish flu, Mitchell returned to Atlanta. She married, but her husband was an abusive bootlegger. Mitchell took a job writing feature articles for the Atlanta Journal at a time when Atlanta debutantes off her class did not work. After divorcing her first husband, she married again, this time to a man who shared her interest in writing and literature. He had also been best man at her first wedding. Margaret Mitchell began writing Gone with the Wind in 1926 to pass the time while recovering from a slow healing auto crash injury. In April 1935, Harold Latham of Macmillan, an editor looking for new fiction, read her manuscript and saw that it could be a bestseller. After Latham agreed to publish the book, Mitchell worked for another six months checking the historical references and rewriting the opening chapter several times. Mitchell and her husband John Marsh, a copy editor by trade, edited the final version of the novel. Mitchell wrote the book's final moments first and then wrote the events that led up to them. Gone with the Wind was published in June 1936. The author tentatively titled the novel Tomorrow is Another Day, from its last line. Other proposed titles included Bugles Sang True, Not in Our Stars, and Tilt the Weary Load. The title Mitchell finally chose is from the first line of the third stanza of the poem Non Sum Qualis Aram Bonus Abrang Yo Sinery by Ernest Dowson. Scarlett O'Hara uses the title phrase when she wonders to herself if her home on a plantation called Tara is still standing, or if it had gone with the wind which had swept through Georgia. In a general sense, the title is a metaphor for the demise of a way of life in the South prior to the Civil War. When taken in the context of Dowson's poem about Sinera, the phrase gone with the wind alludes to erotic loss. The poem expresses the regrets of someone who has lost his passionate feelings for his old passion, Sinera. Dowson's Sinera a name that comes from the Greek word for artichoke, represents a lost love. Gone with the Wind takes place in the southern United States in the state of Georgia during the American Civil War, 1861-1865, and the Reconstruction Era 1865-1877. The novel unfolds against the backdrop of rebellion wherein seven southern states initially, including Georgia, have declared their secession from the United States, the Union, and formed the Confederate States of America. 
the Confederacy, after Abraham Lincoln was elected president. The Union refuses to accept secession and no compromise is found as war approaches. The novel opens April 15, 1861, at Tara, a plantation owned by Gerald O'Hara, an Irish immigrant who has become a successful planter, and his wife, Ellen Robbie Yar O'Hara, from a coastal aristocratic family of French descent. Their 16 year old daughter, Scarlet, is not beautiful, but men seldom realized it once they were caught up in her charm. All the talk is of the coming civil war. There are brief but vivid descriptions of the South as it began and grew, with backgrounds of the main characters, the stylish and highbrow French, the gentlemanly English, the forced to flee and look down upon Irish. Scarlet learns that one of her many beaux, Ashley Wilkes, will soon be engaged to his cousin, Melanie Hamilton. She is heart stricken. The next day at the Wilkes's barbecue at Twelve Oaks, Scarlett tells Ashley she loves him, and he admits he cares for her. However, he knows he would not be happy if married to her because of their personality differences. She loses her temper with him, and he silently takes it. Rhett Butler, who has a reputation as a rogue, had been alone in the library when Ashley and Scarlett entered and felt it wiser to stay unseen during the argument. Rhett applauds Scarlett for the unladylike spirit she displayed with Ashley. Infuriated and humiliated, she tells Rhett, you aren't fit to wipe his boots. After rejoining the other party guests, she learns that war has been declared and the men are going to enlist. Seeking revenge, Scarlett accepts a marriage proposal from Melanie's brother, Charles Hamilton. They marry two weeks later. Charles dies of pneumonia following the measles two months after the war begins. As a young widow, Scarlett gives birth to her first child, Wade Hampton Hamilton, named after his father's general. She is bound by custom to wear black and avoid conversation with young men. Scarlett feels restricted by these conventions and bitterly misses her life as a young, unmarried woman. Aunt Pity Pat is living with Melanie in Atlanta and invites Scarlett to stay with them. In Atlanta, Scarlett's spirits revive, and she is busy with hospital work and sewing circles for the Confederate Army. Scarlett encounters Rhett Butler again at a benefit dance, where he is dressed like a dandy. Although Rhett believes the war is a lost cause, he is blockade running for profit. The men must bid for a dance with a lady, and Rhett bids $150 in gold for a dance with Scarlett. They waltz to the tune of When This Cruel War Is Over, and Scarlett sings the words. Others at the dance are shocked that Rhett would bid for a widow and that she would accept the dance while still wearing black, or widow's weeds. Melanie defends her, arguing she is supporting the cause for which Melanie's husband, Ashley, is fighting. At Christmas, 1863, Ashley is granted a furlough from the army. Melanie becomes pregnant with their first child. The war is going badly for the Confederacy. By September 1864, Atlanta is besieged from three sides. The city becomes desperate and hundreds of wounded Confederate soldiers pour in. Melanie goes into labor with only the inexperienced Scarlet to assist, as all the doctors are attending the soldiers. Prissy, a young slave, cries out in despair and fear, the Yankees is coming. In the chaos, Scarlet, left to fend for herself, cries for the comfort and safety of her mother in Terra. The tattered Confederate States Army sets flame to Atlanta and abandons it to the Union Army. Melanie gives birth to a boy, Bo, with Scarlet's assistance. Scarlet then finds Rhett and begs him to take herself, Wade, Melanie, Bo, and Prissy to Terra. Rhett laughs at the idea but steals an emaciated horse and a small wagon, and they follow the retreating army out of Atlanta. Part way to Tara, Rhett has a change of heart and abandons Scarlet to enlist in the army. He later recounts that when they learned he had attended West Point, they put him in the artillery, which may have saved his life. Scarlet then makes her way to Tara, where she is welcomed on the steps by her father, Gerald. Things have drastically changed Scarlet's mother is dead, her father has lost his mind with grief, her sisters are sick with typhoid fever, the field slaves have left after emancipation, the Yankees have burned all the cotton and there is no food in the house. Scarlet avows that she and her family will survive and never be hungry again. The long tiring struggle for survival begins that has Scarlet working in the fields. There are hungry people to feed and little food. There is the ever-present threat of the Yankees who steal and burn. At one point, a Yankee soldier trespasses on Tara, and it is implied that he would steal from the house and possibly rape Scarlet and Melanie. Scarlet kills him with Charles's pistol and sees that Melanie had also prepared to fight him with a sword. A long post-war succession of Confederate soldiers returning home stop at Terra to find food and rest. Eventually, Ashley returns from the war, 
with his idealistic view of the world shattered. Life at Terra slowly begins to recover, but then new taxes are levied on the plantation. Scarlet knows only one man with enough money to help her, Red Butler Dachi looks for him in Atlanta only to learn that he is in jail. Red refuses to give money to Scarlet, and leaving the jailhouse in fury, she runs into Frank Kennedy, who runs a store in Atlanta and is betrothed to Scarlet's sister, Sue Ellen. Realizing Frank also has money, Scarlet hatches a plot and tells Frank that Sue Ellen will not marry him. Frank succumbs to Scarlet's charms and marries her two weeks later, knowing he has done something romantic and exciting for the first time in his life. Always wanting her to be happy and radiant, Frank gives Scarlet the money to pay the taxes. While Frank has a cold and is pampered by Aunt Pity Pat, Scarlet goes over the accounts at Frank's store and finds that many owe him money. Scarlet is now terrified about the taxes and decides money, a lot of it, is needed. She takes control of the store, and her business practices leave many Atlantans resentful of her. With a loan from Red, she buys a sawmill and runs it herself, all scandalous conduct. To Frank's relief, Scarlet learns she is pregnant, which curtails her unladylike activities for a while. She convinces Ashley to come to Atlanta and manage the mill, all the while still in love with him. At Melanie's urging, Ashley takes the job. Melanie becomes the center of Atlanta society, and Scarlett gives birth to Ella Lorena, Ella for her grandmother Ellen, and Lorena because it was the most fashionable name of the day for girls. Georgia is under martial law, and life is taken on a new and more frightening tone. For protection, Scarlett keeps Frank's pistol tucked in the upholstery off buggy. Her trips alone to and from the mill take her past a shanty town where criminal elements live. While on her way home one evening, she is accosted by two men who try to rob her, but she escapes with the help of Big Sam, the former Negro foreman from Terra. Attempting to avenge his wife, Frank and the Ku Klux Klan raid the shanty town whereupon Frank is shot dead. Scarlet is a widow again. To keep the raiders from being arrested, Rhett puts on a charade. He walks into the Wilkes's home with Hugh Elsing and Ashley singing and pretending to be drunk. Yankee officers outside question Rhett, and he says he and the other men had been at Bell Watling's brothel that evening, a story Bell later confirms to the officers. The men are indebted to Rhett, and his scalawag reputation among them improves a notch, but the men's wives, except Melanie, are livid at owing their husbands' lives to Bell Watling. Frank Kennedy lies in a casket in the quiet stillness of the parlor in Aunt Pity Pat's home. Scarlet is remorseful. She is swigging brandy from Aunt Pity's swoon bottle when Rhett comes to call. She tells him tearfully, I'm afraid I'll die and go to hell. He says, maybe there isn't a hell. Before she can cry any further, he asks her to marry him, saying, I always intended having you, one way or another. She says she doesn't love him and doesn't want to be married again. However, he kisses her passionately, and in the heat of the moment she agrees to marry him. One year later, Scarlet and Red announce their engagement, which becomes the talk of the town. Mr. and Mrs. Butler honeymoon in New Orleans, spending lavishly. Upon returning to Atlanta, they stay in the bridal suite at the National Hotel while their new home on Peachtree Street is being built. Scarlet chooses a modern Swiss chalet-style home like the one she saw in Harper's Weekly, with red wallpaper, thick red carpet, and black walnut furniture. Red describes it as an architectural horror. Shortly after they move into their new home, the sardonic jabs between them turn into full-blown quarrels. Scarlet wonders why Rhett married her. Then with real hate in her eyes, she tells Rhett she will have a baby, which she does not want. Wade is seven years old in 1869 when his half-sister, Eugenie Victoria, named after two queens, is born. She has blue eyes like Gerald O'Hara, and Melanie nicknames her, Bonnie Blue, in reference to the Bonnie Blue flag of the Confederacy. When Scarlet is feeling well again, she makes a trip to the mill and talks to Ashley, who is alone in the office. In their conversation, she comes away believing Ashley still loves her and is jealous of her intimate relations with Rhett, which excites her. She returns home and tells Rhett she does not want more children. From then on, they sleep separately, and when Bonnie is two years old, she sleeps in a little bed beside Rhett, with the light on all night because she is afraid of the dark. Rhett turns his attention toward Bonnie, dotes on her spoils her, and worries about her reputation when she is older. Melanie is giving a surprise birthday party for Ashley. Scarlet goes to the mill to keep Ashley there until party time, a rare opportunity for her to see him alone. When she sees him, she feels 16 again, a little breathless and excited. Ashley tells her how pretty she looks, 
and they reminisce about the days when they were young and talk about their lives now. Suddenly Scarlett's eyes fill with tears, and Ashley holds her head against his chest. Ashley sees his sister, India Wilkes, standing in the doorway. Before the party has even begun, a rumor of an affair between Ashley and Scarlett spreads, and Red and Melanie hear it. Melanie refuses to accept any criticism of her sister-in-law, and India Wilkes is banished from the Wilkes's home for it, causing a rift in the family. Rhett, more drunk than Scarlett has ever seen him, returns home from the party long after Scarlett. His eyes are bloodshot, and his mood is dark and violent. He enjoins Scarlett to drink with him. Not wanting him to know she is fearful of him, she throws back a drink and gets up from her chair to go back to her bedroom. He stops her and pins her shoulders to the wall. She tells him he is jealous of Ashley, and Red accuses her of crying for the moon over Ashley. He tells her they could have been happy together, saying, For I loved you and I know you. He then takes her in his arms and carries her up the stairs to her bedroom, where it is strongly implied that he rapes her, or, possibly, that they have consensual sex following the argument. The next morning, Rhett leaves for Charleston and New Orleans with Bonnie. Scarlett finds herself missing him, but she is still unsure if Rhett loves her, having said it while drunk. She learns she is pregnant with her fourth child. When Rhett returns, Scarlett waits for him at the top of the stairs. She wonders if Rhett will kiss her but to her irritation, he does not doubt he says she looks pale. She says it's because she is pregnant. He sarcastically asks if the father is Ashley. She calls Red a cat and tells him no woman would want his baby. He says, cheer up, maybe you'll have a miscarriage. She lunches at him, but he dodges, and she tumbles backwards down the stairs. She is seriously ill for the first time in her life, having lost her child and broken her ribs. Red is remorseful, believing he has killed her. Sobbing and drunk. He buries his head in Melanie's lap and confesses he has been a jealous cat. Scarlet, who is thin and pale, goes to Tara, taking Wade and Ella with her, to regain her strength and vitality from the green cotton fields of home. When she returns healthy to Atlanta, she sells the mills to Ashley. She finds Rhett's attitude has noticeably changed. He is sober, kinder, polite, and seemingly disinterested. Though she misses the old Rhett at times, Scarlet is content to leave well enough alone. Bonnie is four years old in 1873. Spirited and willful, she has her father wrapped around her finger and giving in to her every demand. Even Scarlet is jealous of the attention Bonnie gets. Rhett rides his horse around town with Bonnie in front of him, but Mammy insists it is not fitting for a girl to ride a horse with her dress flying up. Rhett heeds her words and buys Bonnie a Shetland pony, whom she names Mr. Dot Butler, and teaches her to ride side saddle. Then Rhett pays a boy named Wash 25 cents to teach Mr. Butler to jump over wood bars. When Mr. Butler is able to get his fat legs over a one foot bar, Rhett puts Bonnie on the pony, and soon Mr. Butler is leaping bars in Aunt Mally's rose bushes. Wearing her blue velvet riding habit with a red feather in her black hat, Bonnie pleads with her father to raise the bar to one and a half feet. He gives in, warning her not to come crying if she falls. Bonnie yells to her mother, Watch me take this one. The pony gallops towards the wood bar, but trips over it. Bonnie breaks her neck in the fall, and dies. In the dark days and months following Bonnie's death, Red is often drunk and disheveled, while Scarlet, though deeply bereaved also, seems to hold up under the strain. With the untimely death of Melanie Wilkes who was pregnant again, a short time later, Red decides he only wants the calm dignity of the genial South he once knew in his youth and leaves Atlanta to find it. Meanwhile, Scarlet dreams of love that has eluded her for so long. However, she still has Tara and knows she can win Rhett back, because tomorrow is another day. Margaret Mitchell arranged Gone with the Wind chronologically, basing it on the life and experiences of the main character, Scarlet O'Hara, as she grew from adolescence into adulthood. During the time span of the novel, from 1861 to 1873, Scarlet ages from 16 to 28 years. This is a type of Bildungsroman, a novel concerned with the moral and psychological growth of the protagonist from youth to adulthood, coming of age story. Scarlet's development is affected by the events of her time. Mitchell used a smooth linear narrative structure. The novel is known for its exceptional readability. The plot is rich with vivid characters. Gone with the Wind is often placed in the literary subgenre of the historical romance novel. Pamela Regis has argued that is more appropriately classified as a historical novel, as it does not contain all of the elements of the romance genre. The novel has also been described as an early classic of the erotic historical genre, because it is thought to contain some degree of pornography.
Slavery and Gone with the Wind is a backdrop to a story that is essentially about other things. Southern plantation fiction, also known as anti-Tom literature, in reference to reactions to Harriet Beecher Stowe's anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin of 1852, from the mid-19th century, culminating in Gone with the Wind, is written from the perspective and values of the slaveholder and tends to present slaves as docile and happy. The characters in the novel are organized into two basic groups along class lines, the white planter class, such as Scarlett and Ashley, and the black house servant class. The slaves depicted in Gone with the Wind are primarily loyal house servants, such as Mammy, Pork, Prissy, and Uncle Peter. House servants are the highest caste of slaves in Mitchell's caste system. They choose to stay with their masters after the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 and subsequent 13th Amendment of 1865 sets them free. Of the servants who stayed at Terra, Scarlet thinks, there were qualities of loyalty and tirelessness and love in them that no strain could break, no money could buy. The field slaves make up the lower class in Mitchell's caste system. The field slaves from the Terra plantation and the foreman, Big Sam are taken away by Confederate soldiers to dig ditches and never return to the plantation. Mitchell wrote that other field slaves were loyal and refused to avail themselves of the new freedom, but the novel has no field slaves who stay on the plantation to work after they have been emancipated. American William Wells Brown escaped from slavery and published his memoir, or Slave Narrative, in 1847. He wrote of the disparity in conditions between the house servant and the field hand. During the time that Mr. Cook was overseer, I was a house servant, a situation preferable to a field hand, as I was better fed, better clothed, and not obliged to rise at the ringing bell, but about an half hour after. I have often laid and heard the crack of the whip, and the screams of the slave. Although the novel is more than 1,000 pages long, the character of Mammy never considers what her life might be like away from Tara. She recognizes her freedom to come and go as she pleases, saying, Eyes free, Miss Scarlet. You can't send me nowhere I don't want to go, but Mammy remains duty-bound to Miss Ellen's chili. No other name for Mammy is noted in the novel. Eighteen years before the publication of Gone with the Wind, an article titled, The Old Black Mammy, written in the Confederate Veteran in 1918, discussed the romanticized view of the Mammy character that had persisted in Southern literature. For her faithfulness and devotion, she has been immortalized in the literature of the South, so the memory of her will never pass but live on in the tales that are told of those dear dead days beyond recall. Mickey Macalia, in her book Clinging to Mammy, suggests the myth of the faithful slave, in the figure of Mammy, lingered because white Americans wished to live in a world in which African Americans were not angry over the injustice of slavery. The best-selling anti-slavery novel from the 19th century is Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, published in 1852. Uncle Tom's Cabin is mentioned briefly in Gone with the Wind as being accepted by the Yankees as revelation second only to the Bible. The enduring interest of both Uncle Tom's Cabin and Gone with the Wind has resulted in lingering stereotypes of 19th century African American slaves. Gone with the Wind has become a reference point for subsequent writers about the South, both black and white alike. The Southern Belle is an archetype for a young woman of the antebellum American South upper class. The Southern Belle was believed to be physically attractive abu, more importantly, personally charming with sophisticated social skills. She is subject to the correct code of female behavior. The novel's heroine, Scarlett O'Hara, charming though not beautiful, is a classic Southern Belle. For young Scarlett, the ideal Southern Belle is represented by her mother, Ellen O'Hara. In a study in Scarlett, published in The New Yorker, Claudia Roth Pierpont wrote, the Southern Belle was bred to conform to a subspecies of the 19th century lady, for Scarlet, the ideal is embodied in her adored mother, the saintly Ellen, whose back is never seen to rest against the back of any chair on which she sits, whose broken spirit everywhere is mistaken for righteous calm. However, Scarlet is not always willing to conform. Catherine Lee Seidel, in her book, The Southern Belle in the American Novel, wrote, Part of her does try to rebel against the restraints of a code of behavior that relentlessly attempts to mold her into a form to which she is not naturally suited. The figure of a pampered southern belle, Scarlet lives through an extreme reversal of fortune and wealth, and survives to rebuild Tara and her self-esteem. Her bad belle traits, Scarlet's deceitfulness, shrewdness, manipulation, and superficiality, in contrast to Melanie's good belle traits, trust, self-sacrifice, 
and loyalty, enable her to survive in the post-war South and pursue her main interest, which is to make enough money to survive and prosper. Although Scarlett was born around 1845, she is portrayed to appeal to modern-day readers for her passionate and independent spirit, determination and obstinate refusal to feel defeated. Marriage was supposed to be the goal of all Southern belles, as women's status was largely determined by that of their husbands. All social and educational pursuits were directed towards it. Despite the Civil War and loss of a generation of eligible men, young ladies were still expected to marry. By law and Southern social convention, household heads were adult, white propertied males, and all white women and all African Americans were thought to require protection and guidance because they lacked the capacity for reason and self control. The Atlanta Historical Society has produced a number of Gone with the Wind exhibits, among them a 1994 exhibit titled, Disputed Territories, Gone with the Wind and Southern Myths. The exhibit asked, Was Scarlet a lady? Finding that historically most women of the period were not involved in business activities as Scarlet was during Reconstruction, when she ran a sawmill. White women performed traditional jobs such as teaching and sewing, and generally disliked work outside the home. During the Civil War, Southern women played a major role as volunteer nurses working in makeshift hospitals. Many were middle and upper class women who had never worked for wages or seen the inside of a hospital. One such nurse was Ada W. Backett, a young widow who had lost two children. Backett came from a wealthy South Carolina plantation family that owned 87 slaves. In the fall of 1862, Confederate laws were changed to permit women to be employed in hospitals as members of the Confederate Medical Department. 27 year old nurse Kate, coming from Mobile, Alabama, described the primitive hospital conditions in her journal. They are in the hall, on the gallery, and crowded into very small rooms. The foul air from this mass of human beings at first made me giddy and sick, but I soon got over it. We have to walk, and when we give the men anything, kneel, in blood and water, but we think nothing of it at all. The Civil War came to an end on April 26, 1865 when Confederate General Johnston surrendered his armies and the Carolinas' campaign to Union General Sherman. Several battles are mentioned or depicted in Gone with the Wind. The Atlanta Campaign, made to September 1864, took place in northwest Georgia and the area around Atlanta. Confederate General Johnston fights and retreats from Dalton, May 7-13, to Resaca, May 13-15 to Kennesaw Mountain, June 27. Union General Sherman suffers heavy losses to the entrenched Confederate Army. Unable to pass through Kennesaw, Sherman swings his men around to the Chattahoochee River where the Confederate Army is waiting on the opposite side of the river. Once again, General Sherman flanks the Confederate Army, forcing Johnston to retreat to Peachtree Creek, July 20, five miles northeast of Atlanta. The Savannah Campaign was conducted in Georgia during November and December 1864. Although Abraham Lincoln is mentioned in the novel 14 times, no reference is made to his assassination on April 14, 1865. Ashley Wilkes is the beau ideal of Southern manhood. A planter by inheritance, Ashley knew the Confederate cause had died. Ashley's name signifies paleness. His pallid skin literalizes the idea of Confederate death. He contemplates leaving Georgia for New York City. Had he gone north, he would have joined numerous other ex-Confederate transplants there. Ashley, embittered by war, tells Scarlett he has been in a state of suspended animation since the surrender. He feels he is not shouldering a man's burden at Terra and believes he is much less than a man, much less, indeed, than a woman. A young girl's dream of the perfect night, Ashley is like a young girl himself. With his poet's eye, Ashley has a feminine sensitivity. Scarlet is angered by the slur of effeminacy flung at Ashley when her father tells her the Wilkes family was born queer. Mitchell's use of the word queer is for its sexual connotation because queer, in the 1930s, was associated with homosexuality. Ashley's effeminacy is associated with his appearance, his lack of forcefulness, and sexual impotency. He rides, plays poker, and drinks like proper men, but his heart is not in it, Gerald claims. The embodiment of castration. Ashley wears the head of Medusa on his cravat pin. Scarlet's love interest, Ashley Wilkes, lacks manliness, and her husbands, the calf-like Charles Hamilton, and the old maid in breeches, Frank Kennedy, are unmanly as well. Mitchell is critiquing masculinity in Southern society since Reconstruction. Even Rhett Butler, the well-groomed dandy, is effeminate or gay-coded. Charles, Frank and Ashley represent the impotence of the post-war white South.
its power and influence have been diminished. The word scalawag is defined as a loafer, a vagabond, or a rogue. Scalawag had a special meaning after the Civil War as an epithet for a white Southerner who accepted and supported Republican reforms. Mitchell defined scalawags as Southerners who had turned Republican very profitably. Rhett Butler is accused of being a damn scalawag. In addition to scalawags, Mitchell portrays other types of scoundrels in the novel, Yankees, carpetbaggers, Republicans, prostitutes, and overseers. In the early years of the Civil War, Red is called a scoundrel for his selfish gains profiteering as a blockade runner. As a scalawag, Red is despised. He is the dark, mysterious, and slightly malevolent hero loose in the world. Literary scholars have identified elements of Mitchell's first husband, Barry and Red Upshaw, in the character of Red. Another sees the image of Italian actor Rudolph Valentino, whom Margaret Mitchell interviewed as a young reporter for the Atlanta Journal. Fictional hero Red Butler has a swarthy face flashing teeth and dark alert eyes. He is a scamp, blackguard, without scruple or honor. If Gone with the Wind has a theme it is that of survival. What makes some people come through catastrophes and others, apparently just as able, strong, and brave, go under. It happens in every upheaval. Some people survive, others don't. What qualities are in those who fight their way through triumphantly that are lacking in those that go under? I only know that survivors used to call that quality gumption. So I wrote about people who had gumption and people who didn't, Margaret Mitchell, 1936. Mitchell's use of color in the novel is symbolic and open to interpretation. Red, green, and a variety of hues of each of these colors, are the predominant palette of colors related to scarlet. She is also linked to white by the color of her skin. Symbolically, red and green have been broadly defined to mean vitality, red and rebirth, green. Mitchell interwove the two colors into her description of the Terra plantation, red fields with spring and green cotton. The red fields are blood-colored after rains. The whitewashed brick plantation house is virtually nondescript by comparison to the plantation fields and sits like an island in a sea of red. In springtime, the lawn around the plantation house turns emerald green. For the Irish and others, green in the novel represents Mitchell's commemoration of her green Irish heritage. Gerald O'Hara pridefully sings the weary know the green. Scarlet's green-coated Irish identity is the strength that ensures she will thrive post-war. Rhett likens Scarlet's strength to the mythological figure Antaeus, who stays strong only when he is in contact with his mother Earth. Scarlet's mythical mother is Tara. Scarlet is not all green, her name suggests the erotically charged color red. The only openly scarlet woman in the novel is the red-headed Belle Watling, whose hair is too red to be true. Mammy is reluctant to reveal her red petticoat to Rhett, nevertheless, she has sexual knowledge akin to Belle Watling. Scarlet, whom Mitchell pits against the war, prostitutes herself to pay the taxes on Terra. By her name, Scarlet evokes emotions and images of the color scarlet, blood, passion, anger, sexuality, madness. The sales of Margaret Mitchell's novel in the summer of 1936, as the nation was recovering from the Great Depression and at the virtually unprecedented high price of $3, reached about $1 million by the end of December. The book was a bestseller by the time reviews began to appear in national magazines. Herschel Brickle, a critic for the New York Evening Post, lauded Mitchell for the way she tosses out the window all the thousands of technical tricks her novelists have been playing with for the past 20 years. Ralph Thompson, a book reviewer for the New York Times, was critical of the length of the novel, and wrote in June 1936. I happen to feel that the book would have been infinitely better had it been edited down to say, 500 pages, but there speaks the harassed daily reviewer as well as the would-be judicious critic. Very nearly every reader will agree, no doubt, that a more disciplined and less prodigal piece of work would have more nearly done justice to the subject matter. Gone with the Wind has been criticized for its stereotypical and derogatory portrayal of African Americans in the 19th century South. Former field hands during the early days of Reconstruction are described behaving as creatures of small intelligence might naturally be expected to do. Like monkeys or small children turn loose among treasured objects whose value is beyond their comprehension, they ran wild, either from perverse pleasure in destruction or simply because of their ignorance. Commenting on this passage of the novel, Jabari Asim, author of the N-word, who can say it, who shouldn't, and why, says it is, one of the more charitable passages in Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell hesitated to blame black insolence during Reconstruction solely on mean niggers, of which, she said, there were few even in slavery days. 
Woods. Critics say that Mitchell downplayed the violent role of the Ku Klux Klan in their abuse of Friedman. Author Pat Conroy, in his preface to a later edition of novel, describes Mitchell's portrayal of the Ku Klux Klan as having the same romanticized role it had in The Birth of a Nation and appears to be a benign combination of the Elks Club and a men's equestrian society. Regarding the historical inaccuracies of the novel, historian Richard N. Current points out, No doubt it is indeed unfortunate that Gone with the Wind perpetuates many myths about Reconstruction, particularly with respect to Blacks. Margaret Mitchell did not originate them and a young novelist can scarcely be faulted for not knowing what the majority of mature, professional historians did not know until many years later. In Gone with the Wind, Mitchell explores some complexities and racial issues. Scarlett was asked by a Yankee woman for advice on who to appoint as a nurse for her children, Scarlett suggested a darkie, much to the disgust of the Yankee woman who was seeking an Irish maid, a Bridget. African Americans and Irish Americans are treated in precisely the same way in Gone with the Wind, writes David O'Connell in his 1996 book, The Irish Roots of Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. Ethnic slurs on the Irish and Irish stereotypes pervade the novel, O'Connell claims and Scarlet is not an exception to the terminology. Irish scholar Geraldine Higgins notes that Jonas Wilkerson labels Scarlet, you high-flying, bog-trotting Irish. Higgins says that, as the Irish-American O'Hara's were slaveholders and African-Americans were held in bondage, the two ethnic groups are no equivalent in the ethnic hierarchy of the novel. The novel has been criticized for promoting plantation values. Mitchell biographer Marianne Walker, author of Margaret Mitchell and John Marsh, the love story behind Gone with the Wind, believes that those who attack the book on these grounds have not read it. She said that the popular 1939 film promotes a false notion of the Old South. Mitchell was not involved in the screenplay or film production. James Lowen, author of Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong, says this novel is profoundly racist and profoundly wrong. In 1984, an alderman in Waukegan, Illinois, challenged the book's inclusion on the reading list of the Waukegan School District on the grounds of racism and unacceptable language. He objected to the frequent use of the racial slur nigger. He also objected to several other books, The Nigger of the Narcissus, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Adventures of Huckleberry Finn for the same reason. In 1937, Margaret Mitchell received the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for Gone with the Wind in the second annual National Book Award from the American Booksellers Association. It is ranked as the second favorite book by American readers, just behind the Bible, according to a 2008 Harris poll. The poll found the novel has its strongest following among women, those aged 44 or more, both Southerners and Midwesterners, both whites and Hispanics, and those who have not attended college. In a 2014 Harris poll, Mitchell's novel ranked again as second, after the Bible. The novel is on the list of best selling books. As of 2010, more than 30 million copies have been printed in the United States and abroad. More than 24 editions of Gone with the Wind have been issued in China. Time magazine critics, Lee Grossman and Richard Lacayo, included the novel one their list of the 100 best English language novels from 1923 to the present, 2005. In 2003, the book was listed at number 21 on the BBC's The Big Read Poll of the UK's Best Loved Novel. Gone with the Wind has been adapted several times for stage and screen. Gone with the Wind has appeared in many places and forms in popular culture. On June 30, 1986, the 50th anniversary of the day Gone with the Wind went on sale, the U.S. Post Office issued a one-cent stamp showing an image of Margaret Mitchell. The stamp was designed by Ronald Adair and was part of the U.S. Postal Service's Great American series. On September 10, 1998, the U.S. Post Office issued a 32-cent stamp as part of its Celebrate the Century series recalling various important events in the 20th century. The stamp, designed by Howard Payne, displays the book with its original dust jacket, a white magnolia blossom, and a hilt placed against a background of green velvet. To commemorate the 75th anniversary, 2011, of the publication of Gone with the Wind in 1936, Scribner published a paperback edition featuring the book's original jacket art. The Windies are ardent Gone with the Wind fans who follow all the latest news and events surrounding the book and film. They gather periodically in costumes from the film or dressed as Margaret Mitchell. Atlanta, Georgia is their meeting place. One story of the legacy of Gone with the Wind is that people worldwide incorrectly think it was the true story of the Old South and how it was changed by the American Civil War and Reconstruction. The film adaptation of the novel amplified this effect.
the plantation legend was burned into the mind of public through Mitchell's vivid prose. Moreover, her fictional account of the war and its aftermath has influenced how the world has viewed the city of Atlanta for successive generations. Some readers of the novel have seen the film first and read the novel afterward. One difference between the film and the novel is the staircase scene, in which Rhett carries Scarlet up the stairs. In the film, Scarlet weakly struggles and does not scream as Rhett starts up the stairs. In the novel, he heard her and she cried out, muffled, frightened. Earlier in the novel, in an intended rape at Shantytown, Chapter 44, Scarlet is attacked by a black man who rips open her dress while a white man grabs hold off the horse's bridle. She is rescued by another black man, Big Sam. In the film, she is attacked by a white man, while a black man grabs the horse's bridle. The Library of Congress began a multi-year celebration of the book in July 2012 with an exhibition on books that shaped America, and an initial list of 88 books by American authors that have influenced American lives. Gone with the Wind was included in the library's list. Librarian of Congress, James H. Billington said. This list is a starting point. It is not a register of the best American books, although many of them fit that description. Rather, the list is intended to spark a national conversation on books written by Americans that have influenced our lives, whether they appear on this initial list or not. Among books on the list considered to be the great American novel were Moby Dick, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, The Great Gatsby, the Grapes of Wrath, The Catcher in the Rye, Invisible Man, and To Kill a Mockingbird. Throughout the world, the novel appeals due to its universal themes, war, love, death, racial conflict, class, gender and generation, which speak as special to women. In North Korea, readers relate to the novel's theme of survival, finding it to be the most compelling message of the novel. Margaret Mitchell's personal collection of nearly 70 foreign language translations of her novel was given to the Atlanta Public Library after her death. On August 16, 2012, the Archdiocese of Atlanta announced that it had been bequeathed a 50% stake in the trademarks and literary rights to Gone with the Wind from the estate of Margaret Mitchell's deceased nephew, Joseph Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell had separated from the Catholic Church. However, one of Mitchell's biographers, Darden Asbury Piran, stated that Margaret Mitchell had an intense relationship with her mother, who was a Roman Catholic. Although some of Mitchell's papers and documents related to the writing of Gone with the Wind were burned after her death, many documents, including assorted draft chapters, were preserved. The last four chapters of the novel are held by the Pequot Library of Southport, Connecticut. The first printing of 10,000 copies contains the original publication date, published May, 1936. After the book was chosen as the book of the month's selection for July, publication was delayed until June 30. The second printing of 25,000 copies, and subsequent printings, contains the release date, published June, 1936. The third printing of 15,000 copies was made in June 1936. Additionally, 50,000 copies were printed for the Book of the Month Club July selection. Gone with the Wind was officially released to the American public on June 30, 1936. Although Mitchell refused to write a sequel to Gone with the Wind, Mitchell's estate authorized Alexandra Ripley to write a sequel, which was titled Scarlet. The book was subsequently adapted into a television miniseries in 1994. A second sequel was authorized by Mitchell's estate titled Dret Butler's People, by Donald McCake. The novel parallels Gone with the Wind from Rhett Butler's perspective. In 2010, Mitchell's estate authorized McCaig to write a prequel, which follows the life of the house servant Mammy, whom McCaig names Ruth. The novel, Ruth's Journey, was released in 2014. The copyright holders of Gone with the Wind attempted to suppress publication of The Wind Ungone by Alice Randall, which retold the story from the perspective of the slaves. A federal appeals court denied the plaintiffs an injunction, SunTrust v. Houghton Mifflin against publication on the basis that the book was parody and therefore protected by the First Amendment. The party subsequently settled out of court and the book went on to become a New York Times bestseller. A book sequel unauthorized by the copyright holders, The Winds of Terror by Catherine Benotti, was blocked from publication in the United States. The novel was republished in Australia, avoiding U.S. copyright restrictions. Away from copyright lawsuits, Internet fan fiction has proved to be a fertile medium for sequels, some of them book-length, parodies, and rewritings of Gone with the Wind. Numerous unauthorized sequels to Gone with the Wind have been published in Russia, mostly under the pseudonym Emilia Hillpatrick, a cover for a consortium of writers.
The New York Times states that most of these have a Slavic flavor. Several sequels were written in Hungarian under the pseudonym Audrey D. Milland or Audrey D. Milland, by at least four different authors, who are named in the colophon as translators to make the book seem a translation from the English original, a procedure common in the 1990s but prohibited by Loss and Sethen. The first one picks up where Ripley's Scarlet ended, the next one is about Scarlet's daughter Cat. Other books include a prequel trilogy about Scarlet's grandmother Solange and a three-part miniseries of a supposed illegitimate daughter of Karine. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.